Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, we've been on a great journey together with our series, Holding On to Truth. And uh, two weeks ago, I started with a biblical foundation on the subject of homosexuality and where the Bible stands on that. And last week, we discussed uh, lies and false beliefs, and we addressed those in love by speaking the truth in love. And uh, I've been looking forward to this moment where we get to hear a story of God changing and saving and transforming a life. Uh, and so uh, this is powerful in the sense that now we get to see what God is doing in someone through realizing the things that I preached about, realizing and seeing scripture and letting God move in her life. Now, I'm sure you know that it takes a lot of courage to come up here and pour your heart out you know, and, and share such real raw things and to be transparent and vulnerable before a, a large group of people. And I'm not trying to make her more nervous by saying all that, uh, but it's, it takes a lot. And, um, and I, I wouldn't bring her up here if I didn't think that she has been walking in a journey of repentance. She has been humble. She has been transparent. She has been available. She has been teachable. And uh, she has an amazing story of God's grace and what a great way to, to ring in Thanksgiving by being thankful for what God has done in someone's life. So can we give a warm welcome to our friend and my friend, Stephanie Johnson. Yep. So we're, we're going to hang out together and, and talk, and, um, but I don't know if everyone really knows you enough, and just, you know, maybe some simple things about who you are, what you do, some passions in life, how long you've been coming to Calvary. That'd be great for them to get to know you a little bit before we jump into your story. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Stephanie, um, 31 years old. I've been coming to Calvary probably since... 2010. Um, I basically have walked through this whole process in this church. This has been the church that's been with me the entire time. Um, I have two jobs, both in the art field. One is with my mom who has a graphic design shop and then I also have a photography and videography business. So very artsy, love uh, hiking and cats. Cats are my favorite. So. I have two precious cats, which, funny story, <laughs> this morning when I was getting ready, uh, my cat, Bo, he was laying in the, the cat box, just laying in the litter, playing in the dirt. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I've never seen him do that before. It was really funny. He's probably nervous himself. Yeah, he probably felt that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scripture that we use when it comes to sharing testimonies before you get into that, and um, it's First Timothy 1. And it's when Paul talks about his own life. And I want to read it to the, to the church. I just love, I love this. And we've, we've recently even heard this in a series. But 1 Timothy 1, 15 says, This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. And that's just beautiful. It's powerful. So that's why we're here, because God has saved you, and God has transformed your life, and he continues to, yeah, continues amen. to work. Amen. And so we believe that your testimony is going to be used by God, and many others in this room, and, and many people used yeah. by God to help people that are pulled in or caught in the homosexual lifestyle. And so... Again, thank you for your courage to be here and share. And why don't you start from wherever you feel is best to help us know your story? All right. Well, um, definitely starts in my childhood. That's the beginning of the story. Um, growing up, my mom and my dad had started the graphic 
business I was telling you about. Um, they started it out of their home. My mom was, uh, she used to hand paint the signs and um, being that my mom is the artist of it, you know, it took a lot of her attention. Um, and, you know, as a daughter growing up, a daughter needs the attention from both parents. And um, as I was growing up, I didn't have that love and that connection with my mom. And so there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, confusion in my life even there, because I'm like, you know, why, why am I not getting love from my mom? And as a child, um, I, I couldn't wrap my head around why, why I wasn't getting that. And then uh, as the business continues to grow and build, um, it took a lot of attention from both of my parents. And my, my brother and I were left alone a lot of the times. And um, we'd have babysitters. And one, or not one time, but many a times, I ended up being molested as a child. Um, I mean, we're talking about the age of like maybe three, periodically on to about seven. Um, so I'm exposed to sexual things at such an early age and I'm missing the connection with my mom. Um, and mind you, this is with someone that's close with me who was doing this to me. So there's a sense of like, I'm getting like a value thing going on here that, you know, it's giving me value to do these sexual things. And uh, as I continue to grow older, um, I come across a bag of porn magazines, and now this is more sexual content that I'm in touch with. Now, not, not only was I feeling certain things, but now I'm exposed to more sexual content. And um, I start to end up having dreams about women in my life, and they were sexual dreams. and. I'm starting to have these dreams when I'm getting ready, I'm going through like puberty area. So, you know, it's like hormones on rampant. Um, and I, I didn't understand all the things that were going on. And in the home, there was not really like this place where we would sit down and process things together. Hey, how was your day? What's going on in your life? There, we didn't have time for that. My parents, you know, were doing the best that they could. And, you know, they didn't even have parents that were there for them when they were growing up. So they were only doing the same thing that they knew. And so I'm, I'm trying to process all of this stuff by myself. And um, then the business is demanding so much of my mom's time. Not only was I not getting that attention, but also the rest of the family. And before you know it, the parents go through a divorce. And so... You know, not only did I grow up as a child not really having that connection with my mom, but when the divorce hit, it was detrimental. Um, and now I'm, I'm pulled to go and live with my mom, and my brother is living with my dad. And I was so much closer to my dad and my brother. You know, they were a lot more active in my life, and it makes sense because the business took so much time for my mom. And so when I went to go live with my mom, that was a really tough time because I didn't really have a connection with her. And um, at this point, I think she started to realize that she really wanted to try. She, she started to see the distance between her and I, and she was really trying to um, make up for lost time. But as a kid, I mean, I'm hurting from the divorce. I miss my dad, my brother, my best friend. And my mom's trying to make this effort, and I'm just mad at her. I'm just so angry that any effort that she made, it was like, no. And my no was like a means to kind of punish her because I was so mad. And um, over time, she just wouldn't stop. She wouldn't give up. She was a warrior mom who fought for my life. Um, so much so that when she didn't know what to do, she found the help that she needed to get what she needed to learn. Um, so she starts to go to counseling. And as she goes to counseling, he's a Christian counselor, and he says, well, I'm going to ask that you start going back to church. 
So the cool thing was is that God had my mom to go to church and learn that journey before she was to help me go through that journey. Um, Little did either of us know where that was going to end up. And as she continues going down that journey, I start to go into counseling myself with this Christian counselor. But before we got to him, there was probably about eight different counselors that I went through, all of which were Christian. But um, to be honest, this one that we ended up going with was the only one that prayed before to find out if he should counsel me or not. And that spoke to me, that, that said, this guy takes God serious, and he doesn't want to condone, he doesn't want to mislead, and he recognized his inability, and that meant a lot to me. And, and I said, I want him. That's, that's the counselor that I want. Um, so we journey for a very long time, and eventually um, I end up going with my brother who has a girlfriend at this time, and she ends up inviting my brother and I to go to this church camp retreat, and I used to go to their young adults because they had dodgeball, and I liked dodgeball. So <laughs> I was very active, and um, we'd go to dodgeball, we'd play, and it would, it'd be like a regular like young adult youth group study where you know you got worship, little sermon, then you break off into groups and you, you talk about the sermon. And um, eventually we go to this, this snow camp trip and on the last day there was what was called like a pep rally for Jesus. And I come into this auditorium that's like stadium seating and everybody's on chairs standing up and they're all shouting Jesus. And I'm like, what is this? What is going on? <laughs> and going into that moment, I'm carrying all the brokenness. I'm carrying all my pain, the battle that I've been fighting that nobody knows about. I've not talked about it with anybody. And I'm just like hopeless and in despair. So you can imagine that when the gospel was preached that I lost it. I, I was shaking trembling and crying hysterically in my seat in the pews. And when he asked if anybody wanted to come down, I mean, I could have ran down there um, because I just so wanted hope. I wanted, I wanted purpose. I felt like my life was useless and that it just was defined on sexuality. It was defined, my worth and value was defined in sexuality and sexual things, and I wanted more than that. And um, so I go and I give my life to the Lord, and a person gives me a booklet and says, okay, you know, <laughs> you're born again. And uh, what was it? I think it was Next Gen Z or Next Gen Night. We shared a video. And uh, you have this hope in those moments that you're going to go back and everything's going to be different. Everything's going to be changed. It's going to be so much easier. I come back. Life did feel differently, um, but surely, probably about a week or two later, it started to be the same thing all over again um, because I wasn't really plugged into a church. I didn't go to church on Sundays. It just was youth group on Wednesdays. And, you know, I'm going there for dodgeball. That's my real reason why I was going. <laughs> um, so... Not only do I come back, things are still the same, but now I go deep, and it's bad. It gets really dark. And within a couple of years, I claim homosexuality as my identity. I come out to my family. And um, during that time, that was a, a little bit, that was before my mom got into the counseling. Um, this was, I think, a big part of revealing to her how much help she really needed and that she wasn't equipped for this. And so my mom has, she's shocked. You know, it's like a reality check. Oh my goodness, this is what's been going on with my daughter. This is what she's been fighting. And so we start to go down this journey together. We're in counseling now. Mind you, she's going separately. I'm going separately. And um, we just continue to learn more about God 
and now I'm starting to go to church with my mom as well. And I'm still, I'm not only claiming homosexuality as my identity at this point, but now I'm acting in it. Now I'm having relationships. Now I'm actually carrying out those sexual things with women at this point. And um, every single time, every single time I carried it out, I had no peace in my heart. I felt, I felt convicted continually. And the only time that I think I ever had peace was when I fully just pushed out that, that con the conviction. I was like, no, this is, this is what I want. I love her, this is what I want. And I just kept trying to shush God. Um, and it's interesting because growing up, my dad used to pray with my brother and I every night. Um, we had like, they put me in uh, United Methodist Church Preschool and my dad used to go to United Methodist Church and so my dad had some kind of understanding and he would pray with us every night. So even when I have those convictions, I'm still praying every single night. Um, and I don't know if that continued to keep my heart hearing from God somewhat, um, but maybe it did. And over time, it just was failed relationship upon failed relationship and so much brokenness. And we're just hurting each other. It's just so toxic. And they never could give me what I really wanted. And I would try to say, hey, this is what I want. Can you do this? And they couldn't provide it for me. So I got tired of all the failed relationships. And I think I had, I had one more final relationship. And I was like, I made a joke with my friends. I was like, if this one doesn't work out, I'm going none. I'm, I'm just not even going to date no more. Forget it. <laughs> um, so... So I had that last failed relationship, and um, man, I'm, I'm kind of skipping around. So before that happened, um, as I'm attending the church here, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, and we both were coming here together. And she actually had an interest to be a youth group um, leader. And back then, during that time, you kind of had to do like an interview process, and um, she confesses the sin that she struggles with, which was also homosexuality, and she was rebuked in that. And um, that was by our wonderful, my best friend here, Ryan. <laughs> and during the time when she came back home, I remember being really angry about it. I remember being really mad because I, f I felt like somebody had shined a light on us. Like, like, we were here, but we were kind of hidden, and now it's clear. And we both were just, like, convicted in it. We just knew that we had to do something. We had to end the relationship. So we ended up ending the relationship from that. And I remember just coming in here every single Sunday, crying during every single worship song. And it just was... A continual thing for me as I continue to walk out my identity here at church you know hearing the sermon trying to apply it to my life and then reading my Bible at home um, so after that last failed relationship happened um, I was in college during that time and um, I went early Saturday morning to study in the library and there was this little lady that came in, and when she came in, she's like praising the Lord out loud in the library. And I was like, wow, okay, we're going to church today. And <laughs> she sits down, and she made a claim about she couldn't believe that there were homosexuals in the church that want to be leaders. And I was like, whoa, you want to talk about spotlight? That was that was intense. That's just like so random too. I know. It's like you're in a library and she comes in saying that. Yeah. But it wasn't random, was it? It wasn't random. It made me feel like God saw the exact state that I was in because not only did he use you to help bring truth to to that girl that I was with and myself, 
But now he took it another step further and he sent a divine appointment for me. And so was she like talking to her, co- her coworkers? She or was, I think she was friends with the librarians. Okay. And, gotcha. um, so she was talking to li- those ladies and she's in the, a row of computers in front of me. And then there's me mm. in the second row. And, um, I was like, ma'am, uh, that's interesting that you say that. Like, cause I couldn't avoid it. You know, it, it's, it, that it was exactly my spot. That's where my girlfriend was at. And, it just was like, wow. I said, man, that's, that's crazy that you say that because that's me. And she comes over, like I said, she was a row in front of me. She comes around and sits beside me. And she just like looks me in the eye and she says, I want you to know She said, you're a child of God. That is your identity. Wow. She said, remember that the power of life and death are in the tongue. And what you speak over yourself is important for you to be aware of. Mm. And because this was such a divine appointment, and I knew it was God, because I had nothing that said, hey, I'm a homosexual who wants to be a leader, like written on me anywhere. <laughs> like, I knew it was God. Um, I left there and, um, I, uh, I just knew it was God. And from that day forward, I no longer claim that as my identity. And about within two weeks after that divine appointment happened, I had so many people come up to me asking me, oh, you know, like, what do you label yourself as? What are you? You know, like, are you this? Are you that? And I was just like, I am what I am. I am what I am. I couldn't think of anything else to say, but I am what I am. And I mean, years later, I read that in the Bible, and I was like, okay, that was wild. I didn't think about that. And you mean referring to God says I am that I am? Yeah, I am that I am. So you're saying, you were saying I am who God says I am. Yes. And you just had to learn that as you went along. Yes, when I I got discipled finally, yeah. (laughs) Um, So... Uh, I, I'm coming to church and I come to find out that there's a Bible study and I had written like a prayer request and I got a phone call from your dad, um, Pastor Roland Kuhn. He called me when I was in the middle of temptation. I'm I like spot in the exact time he calls me and he says, hey, Stephanie, uh, how are you doing? And I lost it. I'm, I just cried my eyes out. That's a scary conversation. Like, that's a scary call. <laughs> no, it was, it was good. That's it was, yeah. it was life giving for me. Cause I, I felt yeah. like I needed help. Yeah, I really great. felt like I needed help. And, um, so he says, look, why don't you come in and I'll talk with you and, uh, maybe we can get you plugged into a Bible study or something. And so I come in and I meet with him and, um, some things that I had suppressed came out in that moment with him in that uh, counseling session with him. And I ended up getting involved in a damaged emotions uh, Bible study where we processed our pain. And so, mind you, you know, I'm, I'm no longer claiming that as my identity. I'm now trying to start to be set apart from that life. And I'm listening to God and he's telling me to get rid of certain things, to stop doing certain things. And I wanted freedom. So to me, that was worth it. Um, Because I I just had this hope that God wouldn't be telling me to get rid of these things if he wasn't going to give me something better. I knew that he had something better for me, and it just was faith and hope in all the things that I've been reading. Amen. Amen. And I, I had to believe his word. And I was like, Lord, this is what your word says. I'm going to believe you in that. So um, as I continued, I lost, um, I lost a lot of friends. We're talking about friends of like 10 years. And 
um, I tried my best to keep them. I actually didn't want to let go of those ones. I, you know, I would stop going to the gay bars. I'd stop, you know, going on dating apps. I stopped doing all of that stuff. But I was still trying to hang on to my friends. And I remember calling my friend at the time when I had like a really encouraging service. Like it was, I was really encouraged after a Sunday morning. I called her and I was sharing my joy with her. And she was like, that's great for you, Steph. That's great. Um, that's great for you, but I don't want that. I don't want that. And um, that's when I started to realize that I had to lose my best friend. So the setting apart to be holy and the repentant path. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Started to now take a toll in, in a good way, though. Yeah. By the time, it was painful to lose those things that were such part of your life. Yeah. I mean, God was removing them. Amen. And uh, that was, I would say that one was probably the hardest for me um, because she was like a safe place for me. And um, so when I lost my best friend, it's, and I lost all my other friends, I just, I kind of felt alone. And um, the Bible study honestly was, it came at just the right time. I was getting encouraged continually. I mean, this was a weekly Bible study and they were pouring into my life. So not only am I going to counseling and um, the Bible study and being discipled in that, um, there are also like eight women all in this Bible study that are older. I'm the youngest woman in this class. And I felt like I gained eight moms. So not only was, was I being ministered in my brokenness, but I was also um, receiving kind of like a restoration of what a mother is, what it looks like and um, how nurturing mothers can be. And so God started to show me and give me hope for my mom. And um, now I'm starting to see the change in the fruit of my mom going to counseling and walking her walk with the Lord. And I am starting to see this joy on my mom. Um, in her old life, she was very angry. So when I started to see this joy on her, I'm like, who is this woman? <laughs> This is not my mom. I'm not, I'm not used to that. And uh, so she starts to really make an effort in our, in our relationship. And as I'm walking out all these broken relationships and the pain, my mom and I, we'd stay up till about three in the morning. Um, many, many a nights I, I lost count. And she would just encourage me and walk me through it, remind me of who I am in God. And she'd pray for me. And she just stood by my side. I knew that she never accepted homosexuality in my life because of what the Bible says, but she also never stopped loving me. And she walked through it with me the entire time. Amen. 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 And yeah, uh, praise God. Amen. Praise God. So as God is continuing to restore my mother and I's relationship, I'm being discipled and uh, just continuing to walk the walk. Repentance was a tough one for me. That was a long journey. That was a long journey, because uh, it takes time. You know, first it's, you're, you're, you stop sinning less, and the frequency starts to slow up, and then when you stop carrying out the action, then you start to deal with the thoughts. And now, you know, these thoughts are trying to tell me I feel, I'm feeling this certain way, and it makes sense to me because it's what I'm so used to. So then repentance came to be like, okay, well, I can't be building a nest in that thought. And I had to be mindful with the women that I would spend time with and the ones that were safe for me. And, you know, it's, it was a journey that I walked with the Lord as he continued to disciple me. And all along the way, if I had questions, I would ask the people in our Bible studies, right, ask other leaders, people that were in the church, and 
they always pointed me to scripture. They always encouraged me and prayed for me. And, um, Amen. and that's, that's pretty much my testimony. Amen. Yeah. We praise God. Yes. Amen. 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 So your relationship with your mom has improved greatly. Amen. Praise yes. the Lord. God's been restoring it's that. It's my mom there right there. Yep. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Yeah. And thank you for being so real and vulnerable about that. And, and you're right. Your repentance journey was not uh, perfect either. And right. a lot of it isn't. You know, it's hard. There's ups and downs. There's slip. There's falling back into sin. There's but the thing is, is every time that you slipped up, you came to us or yeah. we worked it out and we you confessed sin and you were transparent and and you were teachable and you would plug yourself into discipleship. And yes. um, by the way, if you've ever you know questioned whether you should do your Bible study, now you know why you should do a Bible study. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. It's so true. Though. Community is is it was a, that's the biggest part of my story. You know, I, I lost one community to gain mm. a even better community wow. that, that didn't love me conditionally if only I was doing what they were doing, but it was like they loved me whether I was messing up or if I was walking right. They yeah. were with me the entire time. Yeah. 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 So you've been listening to the sermons. Mm -hmm. What's been hitting you from these, these past two weeks? What's something that's been a burden that you would want to share with us that or maybe even just confirmation of anything that's been preached? Um, I, I really appreciated, and it stuck with me, last week's sermon uh, about the lies. Because there were, there were two lies that I was definitely impacted by. Um, it was that I was born gay and that I could be a gay Christian. Those were two lies that were really uh, big strongholds in my life. Um, and the being born gay one, when I had that as my belief, that I actually got angry with God because I was like, God, why did you make me this way? And so obviously that's the fruit of that lie. It's not good. Um, and then the gay Christian that was more so when I'm, you know, trying to walk out repentance because that's how I'm trying to make sense of it. And I'm like, well, maybe this is how I do it. And, um, but it, it just didn't work. And I couldn't reconcile because if I ignored the conviction about homosexuality, it would harden my heart to other convictions. Wow. And so I had to say yes to this conviction so that I didn't miss out on convictions in other areas because we can harden our heart to his voice. Um, and I didn't want that. I, I feared that. I feared not being able to hear from him. Yeah, and you didn't just struggle with one sin. Right. We're sinners, so we <laughs> exactly. struggle with, with more than one. And so I think that's huge yeah. to, to be able to acknowledge this one helps you acknowledge all the other areas in your life yeah. where it was not in line with God's word. So tell us, um, what's next for Stephanie? Well, I, uh, I don't want to uh, feel like I've arrived. You know, I don't, I don't want to think that, okay, I've arrived now, I've overcome this thing, and now I'm good. Um, because there was a point in my life where I felt that way, and uh, that just didn't work for me. <laughs> Um, so I just want to keep enduring, especially nowadays where homosexuality is so heavy in the world and the indoctrination of the children that are growing up. My, my burden is to go and to share my testimony because, you know, I know that not everybody's going to receive it, but I'm not sharing it for the, for the 99 who don't need it. I'm sharing it for the one who does. Because, yeah, amen. Because I, th I think about me. I think about that little girl who was hurting and who was molested as a child, who was fighting a battle that nobody knew about, that nobody could reach but God. He heard me crying every night. He heard my prayers. And if I could say 
my story to encourage somebody else. Because I couldn't imagine if I was going through what I was going through and I heard somebody else share their testimony, that would have, that would have given me everything that I needed. Um, it would have validated that I wasn't alone. And uh, I really want to say, I want to share my story continuing, continuing on. And uh, another part of the restoration process that I didn't expect to happen was this new desire for men that I would have. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, and uh, currently there is a man in my life and uh, he, uh, he and I are getting ready to do premarital counseling. And um, yeah, praise God. Praise God. <sighs> yes. And, you know, the journey doesn't stop. You know, it, the, the journey continues on and I have to continue to carry my cross. I have to remember my value is not in relationships with people. My value is in the Lord. I don't get fulfillment even in my relationship with the guy in my life. Nobody can take that place but the Lord. That place is made only for Jesus, and he's the only one that can fill that for me. Amen. So uh, I just want to endure to the end and uh, just continue in the same path that the Lord has already laid out. You know, he, all those years of walking through that repentance, he was developing um, the pattern for me, the way. He was showing me the way and how to continue in this life. And um, yeah, I just, I'm just going to keep enduring to the end in faith. Yep. Amen. Uh, encouragement for us, you know, as a church, what can we do to minister to those in the, in the entire community, the LGBTQ plus community? If you could just give a couple things in closing of like, you know, how we can help. Mm. What do we need to do? I would invite them into your life. Um, whether that's just for a dinner or to just hang out, maybe go bowling. Um, invite them into your life and let them be a witness to your life. And be aware that they're watching you. They're watching how you walk your walk. And they for you to not hide your struggles. Show them your struggles and show them how you walk through your struggles because they need to see that and they may not ask you for help, but they're watching. And pray for an opportunity. Pray for an opportunity to be that safe place for them to talk. And when they are ready to talk, be there, be present, love them. And don't sway from the truth, because they do know the truth. It's written in our hearts. And if you can be full of grace and full of truth, you'll have a lifelong friend. Yeah. And, uh, so I've yeah. noticed about your mom and the church, we never watered down the truth. We held on to it. And we didn't know but the Holy Spirit was convicting her yeah. when we weren't around her. And so the conviction was matching the truth. Amen. And because of that, you surrendered to point. God. That's a good point. We weren't confusing you. We were confirming what you were feeling through the Holy Spirit. Because if you think about it, if you guys had swayed from the truth, and I'm reading in my Bible, and I go home, and I hear something different from God, or if I heard something else and it wasn't the voice of God, how that would be misleading for me. So the fact that what you said mm. lined up also with the conviction of the Lord, it helped me to know which way to go. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The truth sets us free. Yeah. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. There is, I'm sure, maybe someone in this room right now who's hearing this story or someone watching online saying, Stephanie, that's me. What would you say to that person if you could? Just anything to help them come towards God, what would you say? I 
I would just say, come home. Mm. God's not mad at you. He knows your pain. He's watched you struggle. He sees you crying when no one else is around. He's made a way for you. Just receive him. Amen. Just receive Jesus. Don't push him away. He wants to love you. Amen. He's not going to beat you. That's right. And he'll never leave you, even if everybody else does. He's the one constant thing in your life. Yes. He can be that for you. So I would just say, come home. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Come home. Thanks, God. Wow. Well, after service here at one o'clock, we're going to have a Q&A with her mom. She's been gracious enough to join us, and we're going to allow parents and anyone in here to ask those questions that could help you. Um, and so we'll be here at one o'clock. So we're just taking a moment just to transition, and we're going to spend an hour taking questions from the audience. And uh, thank you for sticking around for that. Um, can we just give her one more thank you and praise God? Thank you so much, Stephanie. Wow, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. While we stay standing, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for family and friends that you're loving on and ministering to. And, you know, one of the things you said in the first service, too, was don't stop holding on to truth. Yeah. Love them that way as well. And uh, keep loving your family and friends. Keep praying for them. Don't sway from the truth because the Holy Spirit is working behind the scenes. He's Amen. working in our hearts. Amen. And we're believing today for your family members, your friends, your neighbors that God would begin to work on them. Amen? Yes, amen, amen. So why don't we pray? And this goes for all types of lifestyles, all kinds of sins, right? This isn't just one. We want people to be delivered from addictions, from anything, whatever's going on. So let's think about them and let's pray for them. Let's close our eyes and, and, and go to God. Lord, first of all, thank you for your grace poured out upon us for the forgiveness of our sins. God, we thank you that this is just one story, that Stephanie's story is just one of what you've done in this room, Lord. God, we thank you that you were with her the entire time. You never forsake her, Lord. You chased after her, Lord God. You left the 99 for the one, and now that one will reach more than one, and we thank you for that. God, I pray you would strengthen her. Continue to sanctify, set her apart, Continue to grow her, Lord. You have made her holy. Now progressively move that holiness to become more like Christ. Strengthen her in her relationship, Lord God, with her mom, her dad, her brother, her family, and Lord, her fiance. And God, we thank you for the restoration, the full circle, Lord, that you are doing in her life. And Lord, use her in a powerful way, God. Empower her by your Holy Spirit to deliver this testimony, God, because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And God, we believe that she's going to reach the one and the many, Lord. God, we, we lift up and intercede for our family members and friends right now who are caught up in this trap and this, these lies from Satan. Lord, we pray you would deliver them Lord God, rescue them, convict, encourage, love. Lord, draw them to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be the church, Lord, that would be patient enough to walk alongside them, Lord. And I thank you, God, for the humility of Stephanie all these years. I thank you, God, for her heart of repentance, Lord, her, her transparency and honesty with us as leadership of a church her willingness to come under rebuke, her willingness to come under discipline, Lord. We thank you, God, that she was humble. She saw the love in us even when we disciplined, even when we rebuke and corrected God. She received it with grace and humility. And God, because of that, we are seeing a changed person right before us, a saved life, a transformed life that you're going to use. You have redeemed her, God, for such a time as this. Lord, bless her and her mom as they help other families and her dad and her family, Lord. 
Use them in a powerful way. God, we give you all the glory and praise, and we trust you're going to work in the people we have prayed for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow. Praise God.